you back. I'm not very good at this. I've never wanted to try again. Have dinner with me. Okay, fine. I will have dinner with you. Because I'm hungry. But we are only talking, and that is it. Gotta be quicker than that, Cray. <sighs> are you happy? I've never been happier. Take him off. woman who tried to save him. He's changing. It's not what he wants anymore, but it's what he needs. Looking so crazy in love. Got me looking, got me looking so crazy in love. Baby, you got me. You got me. Just gonna stand there gawking. Yes. If something were to happen to you, I could never forgive myself. Uh oh, uh oh, oh no, no. Marsha Gay Harden is here. Let's hear it one more time. This woman is amazing. Hi, guys. One of the best we have. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. You look amazing. I love your dress. Thank you. I spent all day trying to get into it. <laughs> Marsha, uh, the second movie of the, the Fifty Shades series, when, after having made the first one, you have a new director here, right? What was that like? Uh, you know, I think they transformed from the first one. We had a female director on the first one, Sam, and now we have James Foley, and he's a little bit more of an action director. And so that's what comes into Fifty Shades Darker. There is some action intrigue to it. But E.L. was very clear that she also wanted it. She wanted to highlight the romance of it. So it's a big creative part of the of the of the the filming, right? Yeah. She's on set every day. Um, her husband, I think, Niall, wrote the scripts for Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades Freed. So she was very, very involved in it. And I think what she wanted, she likes that it's erotica. She likes that you know it's, there's all the toys and all the fluff and all that of it. But I think the basic undercore, underbelly of it, so to speak, is this non-Disney Cinderella story. Right, so, so to speak, right? It's not Disney. Um, but she's got, you know, you've got the base of the girl next door who's attractive, but wait until you get her in a gown and then you see how really beautiful she is. And she's got a kind of low paying job and she meets the billionaire, beautiful, and it's too bad Jamie Dorman is so not good looking. Uh, she meets him, just I mean, not even like a real looking person practically, and he's all, he's. Did you ever tell Jamie that? Jamie, yeah, but he's real. not, he's like, look at his tattoos, and he's like, Jamie, look look how you look, and he's like, he, who, who, and then he goes into his act, <laughs> who all didn't know what you're talking about, he's like, bull, <laughs> but you know, He's wonderful, and then she meets him, and she changes him. She transforms him through the power of her love. She transforms him, and I think that if it wasn't for that kind of underbelly of a story, I don't think this would be the phenomenal hit that it was, that it is, right now. What's it like uh, for you as an actress on set? With it seems sounds like um, this is a usually a pejorative term, and I don't mean it that way, but cooks in the kitchen. 
What is it like for me to be with all the cooks in the kitchen? Yeah, on the on the set. You know, you have yeah. you have ELG. I'm standing have, over the silverware drawer, making sure that things are counted correctly in the silverware drawer. I mean, this was clearly their show. This was their setting, and you had to understand when you came into it what was your part in telling this story. For me, my part was to be um, as intricate and in this vast fantasy to find the really small character details that would let you understand another kind of woman. The nurturing mother, the doctor, the woman who chose to take care of him, the woman who began the process of transformative love for him. That was my job. I was not allowed in the Red Room of Pain and Pleasure. And <laughs> I don't think you want mama in the Red Room of Pain and Pleasure. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, we get out, get out, and quit going through the drawers. <laughs> There's nothing in there you want. I mean, like, my character, I used to tweet about it and make fun of it. My character um, would think that uh, nipple clamps were like a sweater clasp. You know, like, <laughs> that's what she would think they were. So she would have no idea. She's like, oh, that's so lovely. And they'd be like, no, that's not what they're for, mama. Um, so it was fantastic to just be there. So, I mean, with, when Sam left, it was a different uh, voice that came in with Foley. And so we would discuss those character details because it is a big fantasy. It is larger than life, this world that they're in. And so how real should we make it? How how sometimes you needed to just know my job is to get in there, plant a kiss, and get off the screen because what it's really about is Anna going, ooh, ooh, while she feels those, you know, <laughs> magic balls inside of her, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, now, James Foley, uh, he hadn't directed, I think, a, a feature in a long time. He's like a wonderful filmmaker from the 80s and 90s, yeah. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, At Close Range. Right, House and of Cards. House of Cards. Right. And yeah, now he's been doing a lot of right. television. Is there an element of Fifty Shades due to the fact that uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, EL, it's EL's kind of, kind of work and she's the writer that it feels somewhat similar to making television rather than making sort of like an auteur's vision of a film? The amount of money spent on this did not feel like television to me <laughs> in any way. Um, now, I don't really know how to answer that question because it felt like um, you're telling stories in sequence. You know the end, uh, whereas in television you often don't. I mean, on, on Code Black, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what my character's going to become. And when I did Damages, one episode, I'm a person who hates uh, CEOs and hates corporate um, law, the next thing I'm taking over a corporation, I'm like, wait, 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 how'd I get from there to there? Or when I would do um, How to Get It With Murder. When I first did it, I thought I was the victim, um, was the uh, suspect. And you have no idea where you're going. And this one, you know, that's a great thing about doing film and or theater. You know your character's arc. You know your story arc. And then you're responsible for building it. I think what Foley brought to it was a kind of, um, was the action. He wanted to take it outside of of the bedroom, so to speak. He wanted to put it out on the, he wanted to make it more accessible and by having it more action, by having her character more threatened by other people and more um, in dialogue with other people, I think that's what he achieved. Have you seen it? Does it feel more accessible uh, to, to a wider audience? You know, I saw it with a really limited female audience. There was like six of us, and we were like, where's the wine? Where's the champagne? You know? And I, if it had it been a really big audience, I would have felt awkward. I mean, like, you don't want to find your boss. Like, hi, enjoy. You don't want to find people that you know, like your neighbors. Can you imagine? This is the Jones over there. They're going to have fun tonight um, <laughs> after they see the movie. Um, it's, it was a lot of women. So I do think that this, when I look at the fan base and I look at how the fans are tweeting back and how the fans are involved in it, I think the audience just keeps growing for it. The fans are wonderful. They're tongue in cheek with it. They get it. They get that it's a fantasy. They are in love with these two. They get Mama Gray. They, you know, I used to send out some naughty little tweets along the line of this sweater clasp. And I think when I was told by Universal I couldn't do it anymore, but I'll tell you one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, because I don't do it anymore. As a good girl, I, I fell in line um, because it was more about the romance, but I had sent out one. Maybe I went too far, I don't know. But um, I sent out a picture of anal beads, and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> she remembers. I sent out a picture of anal beads, and I said, they were all like, dear Christian. They were all, and I was like, dear Christian, thank you so much for that lovely bracelet under the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it wasn't for me. Oh well, so pretty. And, and you know, then all the fans would write back, "No, that wasn't for you, Mama Gray." Oh no, oh no. And they would send those pictures, the the emoji of like the crying 
<laughs> smiley face. And so I, I did a bunch of those, and I had, the, I had a lot of fun doing that. And I, had, I was shut down. But although there was one I did do recently, it was, I think, Facts in Your Face said, did you know that you have great cardio health the more orgasms you had? And I said, dear Christian, how's your heart? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you bring up you bring up Code Black, which is a, a, a wonderful medical drama that that you're part of. What's it like for you doing television now every season to have a show that you're sort of, you know, on set of every every day? What nine months out of the year? Yeah, just about. I love it. We started in July shooting, and what I didn't know because you take television first, and you're like, oh great, I get to be with my family, and I'm like, not because anybody who doesn't know any any film or television day is 12 hours minimum. That's the minimum. And if you're a girl, you add extra two for hair and makeup. And then if you go over those, an extra one. So it's a 15 hour day. You get to be with your kids if you do like a multi-camera sitcom where you show yeah. up at nine and go, Ugh, Literally. And the audience claps and then you go home. My son went from being 12 to growing a beard. I mean, like, I don't know, who are you? How did that happen? But yeah, it's really, you're right. It's gotta be multi-camera sitcom. That's the way you do it. But the work is really, really rewarding. And I should speak. I mean, I get a, a few scenes off. I get occasionally in a blue moon, I'll get a day off. The crew is the one who works the hardest. But I love it. I love my character. I love that she's tough. I love that she's a working woman. I love that she's a woman who um, is a bit of a renegade, a cowboy. I love that Michael Seisman, our creator, has given her this wonderful arc so that by the, I don't know if anybody saw season one, episode one, this little girl gives her her dad's heart to another little girl in the hospital. Um, that character comes back at the end of season two, the next two episodes, and my character has a strong interaction with her. So it's really, it's the classic dramatic, you know, like the, the peer again, the classic dramatic thing is transformation. And so in the beginning, Leanne, my character was kind of closed down, emotionally closed down, um, angry, still a cowboy, still capable of laughing, but not so much. And she's gone through this transformation to where she's a little more spiritual, she's a little more relaxed, she's a little um, happier, and now this kid is gonna come back into her life and we'll see what happens with that relationship. But it's a, it's a great arc. Do you feel like you could have done a show like Code Black earlier in your career? Because I always, I look at something like Code Black and we had Viola Davis here who does, you know, How to Get Away with Murder. And I think the stuff that you have to do as an actress or an actor on a medical drama or any sort of like night primetime drama on television is so demanding every day. You're crying, you're having fits. There's some sort of tragedy that's happening. You have to know how to tap into that well pretty quickly, I would imagine, and that requires a fair amount of practice craft work. I think you're right. I think craft does play a big role into it, although I'll tell you, I've always been a crybaby. Um, <laughs> I've always had this emotional reservoir that was difficult not to bring. Sometimes I'd have to think, like I remember auditioning for Angels in America, and I remember going in and the very, from the first moment I started until the end, it was like one giant sob on the floor. And I had to clean it up afterwards. And they're like, okay, that was nice. Now that you've got that out of your system, now let's work on the craft. On this, you were this nominated for it. a Tony for, for Angels in America, right? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, thank you. When you were a part of Angels, that was the, was that the original, the original production? The, the, the original was in California. So I was in the original New York production. That's a, what was, what was that like? I have to ask. I mean, it's Tony Kushner. It's one of the, you know, He's one of our greatest playwrights in the world, I think, and in America, certainly, and tackles the big issues. And boy, can I, I would love to see his Angels in America today. Yeah. I would love to see his version of today's Angels in this, <laughs> this America. Um, because he had all that about the immigrants and everything. I mean, he was a, um, some of his ideas are precursors to where we are and what we're dealing with today. And one of his characters in Angels in America was a huge influence on our, our current president. Roy Cohen was a massive influence. On, on very, our it's an interesting um, spiral on some level. But he is a, he's brilliant with words and he's brilliant with love and he's brilliant with, uh, with diversity and acceptance and exposure with love. And so for me, that was the first... Um, my first introduction to New York Broadway theater was being in that play. And I was living down in the West Village at the time, and I used to go, I'd get done with the show, and I'd go downtown, and, I was, and so someone would walk by, and they'd go, wait a minute, are you Marsha Harden? And I'd say, yes. And they'd say, I just have to tell you, I took my parents to see that show, and then I told them I was dying. Or I took my parents to see Angels, and then I told them I was gay. And uh, they said they wanted to meet my boyfriend. And you, you go, I'm a part of that? I'm a part of that in your life, I and mean, it was incredible because it was so 
um, beautiful and full and rich. And it was very, very rarely in an artist's life do you get to the point, and I never use this word, but I'll use it today, that mission word, where you go, I was meant to be here to be a part of this thing that is so relevant and so pertinent to what society is going through today. Very rarely do you get to do it. Most of the times, you just take a job, right? And, and you're glad to have it, and you try to make it as relevant as you can. But on that job, I didn't have to work at it. I didn't have to try to make it relevant. It was. People would stand up in the audience because there was an unprotected sex scene that the two guys engage in in the audience. And men would stand up as, they, as he says, the condom broke, do you want, should I continue? And men would stand up in the audience and go, no, 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 no. You know, and you knew they were suffering. That's unbelievable, because I would imagine that people approach you for, for work and it, and, it, and it means something to them all the time, but this is also a piece of work that is also just incredible. Like an objectively wonderful piece of work that you were a part of, that I imagine you kind of get to share in that with them when they approach you. It's not Absolutely. like a small part in an action movie or something where you're like, oh, that meant something to you? Oh, that's right. great, I guess, thanks. Right, that's right, that's right. Well, that's right, and I, I'm, I'm sure it won't be, Never mind. <laughs> won't be there for 50, I'm sure it won't be there for 50. But there may be some women who come to me at some point and go, you know what? And they're like in their own way, I didn't understand my body. And for those people, it will be as profound that they understand and love their body. Not as profound, I guess, as age. You can't say that, but it'll be it'll have its own meaning. Let me say that. Now, you know, you mentioned um, what Angels in America would feel like if it was about right now in this America, and we were talking about your Twitter feed, and your Twitter feed has been populated by a lot of uh, opinions, which I can agree with 100%. If you look at my Twitter feed, I think it's even more militant right now on the, on the liberal side. Um, and I congratulate you for, or not congratulate, I commend you for speaking out. And I'm curious what you think about people who say celebrities shouldn't speak out, or that's enough. You're out of touch. You're in your own bubble. You're out of touch with the rest of us. Because Meryl spoke out wonderfully at the Golden Globes. Meryl Streep, I'm not on a first I'm name. Sorry, you mean the over, overrated Meryl Streep, yeah, exactly. that one? <laughs> now I understand, go ahead. Or, or at the SAG Awards. The SAG Awards is probably the, one of the most political uh, award ceremonies we've ever seen. And I personally think it's necessary. I think it's beautiful. Um, Mahershala Ali's speech was, one, was, was incredibly touching and beautiful. But what do you say to those who are trying to sort of silence the voice of people who, who have them? Well, I think what was interesting in Meryl's speech was she immediately made it personal. Celebrities aren't just these people who live in mansions. Most of us don't. Most of us are working actors hoping to get the next job so we can put our kids through school and you know, I'm a single mom. So she made it personal and by calling out the people by name, she made it personal and she made it internationally personal. And so that was number one. So celebrities are just people whose opinions may or not may not be listened to, no more or no less valuable than the hater who responds to me, you're out of touch with you know, the Christian right. I think, well, I may be. I may be out of touch with people who throw bombs at abortion centers. I don't know, I'm out of touch with that because that doesn't seem like God to me. So we're all, we all have our own ideas about, about things, but what I am in touch with is my constitutional rights, and what I am in touch with is my love for this country, and I am in touch with what I grew up believing were the values of this country, and I think there are better ways to do things, and so because people are afraid to speak right now because the backlash is very strong, even if it's simply a... Um, the backlash is always humiliating. Meryl Streep is overrated. This guy's tears are fake. Um, this this congressman needs to learn to not talk, talk, talk. But he needs to. You know, there, it's always about denigrating and humiliating the person and the person's work, and that's a technique that is in and of itself inferior. It's never about what they're saying. It's about who is saying it, which and is how a bully. they're saying. Yeah, it's a bullying tactic. So we must not be afraid to speak out against that. And so if I can, or you can, or anybody can, I mean, it's not just celebrities tweeting. There's a lot of people tweeting. There's a lot of people responding. And at those marches downtown, there were 750,000 people in Los Angeles weren't just celebrities. They were people. They were moms. They were people, they're people who want health care. There are people whose parents are immigrants. There are people who are immigrants themselves. There are people who are, you know, so that's all the people trying to understand where the nation is going and make sure it's a nation that is 
um, has the values that we uphold, that we believe in, and that it's constitutionally, that it's legal, it's you know, within our constitutional rights. So uh, why, sh why shouldn't I be allowed to tweet about that? Why shouldn't I be allowed to talk about that? I'm not trying to please anybody. I'm just trying to, you know, to teach my kids what I think is right. Absolutely. As someone who's freaking out all the time right now, I thank you for, for, for using your voice. Thank yeah, you. I do freak out myself. I do. You've worked with some amazing directors in your career. This is called the segue. <laughs> we can talk politics for days. <laughs> we can field questions. <laughs> You've worked with some uh, amazing directors in your career. Uh, I want to throw a couple out and just sort of get your, your first response or your thought about, about working with them. What, the first thing that really comes to your mind. We'll start with your first movie, your breakthrough role, The Coen Brothers in, in Miller's Crossing. Such the Coen movie. Brothers are genius. You want to see anything that they do. And I, have, I was spoiled because they were my, the first people I worked with. And also a little bit um, altered because from, this day, from that day on, whenever I do anything, I think, what would the Coen Brothers think? What would they think? And if it's something, you know, less than or tawdry or selling toothpaste or whatever it is, I think, what would they think? What would they think? Oh my God, can I do it? Can I do it? And you have to do it anyway. But but they become that this voice in my head, this standard of this voice in my head, because they are so excellent and their pursuit of of craft is so diverse and they're so willing to take risks and chances. So I had a great time working with them. I couldn't believe that they hired me. I mean, I was, a com I was unknown. You're incredible. And they hired me to be a lead in their movie. And that's what they did with Frances McDormand and Holly Hunter and, and Judy Dench. I mean, they, she, she was not unknown. But they launched so many actresses' careers. Um, Judy Davis, I mean, so many actresses' careers. It was just amazing because they didn't care. She's right for the role. I want her. And they, they got their way. They were amazing. They're so, they're seemed, or uh, everyone thinks they're very methodical, but every actor always says they felt totally free on their set. I felt free, but not to be, um, like, you don't stray from the script. And I had just come from school, so that was a bit of a downfall on some level for me. Because if anybody in here in acting school, anybody here, over here? Okay, well, so for those of you who don't know, when you're in acting school, they talk about things like your breath, meaning that your breathing in that scene was really great. And you're like, thank you. I'm really <laughs> trying to center my breathing in that scene. Thank you for noticing. Or then they'll go, your voice was really, because when I was first in acting school, I talked a little bit like this. And my teacher used to always go, get on your voice. I'd be like, I am on my voice. He'd go, no, get on your voice until you would get on your voice. And I'd think, God, it sounds so deep. How can I say, I love you in that voice? I have to say, I love you in that voice. Because no one says, I love you in that voice. Like, well, who is that? And they'd say, say, I love you in that voice. And then I would say, I love you in that voice. And because I was on my voice, I would cry. Remember, I told you I can cry. I'd be like, oh, I love you. And I would cry all through the scene. <laughs> OK, go and do it again. But <laughs> But, so you do all this where every little aspect of what you do, your hand motions, your facial expressions, your breathing, they're looked at by your students and they're commented on by people. Then you go and do a film. And you get done with the scene and they go, all right, great, moving on. And you're going, what? So, it's, so Ethan, Ethan, um, my breathing or uh, my motions are like, did you like it? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you feel like you're running around going, do you like me? Do you like me? I mean, it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling, but you just need, you're so used to feedback about the most minuscule and picky details that when you don't get them, I don't know if other actors would say the same thing, when you don't get them on your first film, you kind of were left a little bit, uh, you, oh, was, was I good? Was I okay? Did I do what you needed? And then you try to cover it. And that's even worse. That's like trying not to cough in church, right? And you know your face becomes, <laughs> you, you come completely distorted to try not to laugh at the dinner table. And you're like, <laughs> as you just absolutely were. So, so it was, for, emotionally, it was all hidden. But it was, it was a little bit tough for me not to get that. But then, if you said anything like, Ethan, I just wanted to know. And I always ask Ethan for some reason. We just became real buddies. And I said, I just, you know, did you, was it successful? I mean, did you like what I was doing? And he was like, ah! Yeah, it was great. Come on, moving on. And so you would move on to the next to the next setup, and you and you learn how to be your own. Um, you learn how to be your own eye, your own mirror, to 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 know when your your own honesty prevail. I mean, that's the thing that was important to me. Was it, was it honest? Was it could I was it did I sculpt it okay? Because um, honest isn't enough. It's not a museum piece. Did it have some artistry to it? And you just learn how to be your own 
watcher. Well, that sounds like a great learning experience for going on to work with Clint Eastwood. Okay. <laughs> Clint Eastwood. Now, Clint, I'll tell you a little story. Okay, Clint, um, you, he's famous for doing one take, right? He doesn't want to do more than one or two takes. He doesn't want to work more than eight hours a day, apparently. No, but he, he's awesome that way, right? Because the crew actually has a life and, and family. So we go, I go to do um, Space Cowboys right after right. we were shooting Pollock. So I, we had to go back to shoot Pollock because Ed had to have like four months to get fat. So I, during that little brief interim time, it was the perfect time for me to go do Space Cowboys. And Ed made the phone call to Clint and he said, Clint, she's a good girl. And Clint said, she's a good girl? I said, yeah, she's a good girl. Hmm, <laughs> she's a good girl. Okay, and I got the part because I'm a good girl. So we're in the trailer now, the hair and makeup trailer, and I hadn't met him. And I still have my little Pollock hairdo, and I was like, someday they're going to give me a wig because I can't be space shuttle mission control with this crazy Pollock hairdo. No wig came down the line. I got my costume fitting, and the day after I'm shooting. So now here comes Clint in the trailer, and he comes down, and he says hello to all his crew, which he knows like family, and they all hello, hello. And he gets to me, and I was so nervous, because he's a legend. He was rawhide. I was in love with him. We used to pretend like we were them. I got to be mushy, my sister got to be rawhide, and one got to be kitty or whatever. So it, we, we loved him. So I, he comes coming down the aisle, and I lurched at him, I, out of my seat, lurched from the makeup chair <laughs> into his arms. And all of the hair and makeup girls were like, because <laughs> you don't lurch at Clint Eastwood. I lurched. My voice became something that I've never heard <laughs> before or since from my own body. Ah, it was like, wait a minute. I giggled. I don't giggle like that. I giggle. Ah, and then I, then I said to him, I'm Marsh K. Harden. And there was a pause. I said, I'm in your movie. <laughs> and he said, I know. I cast you. I, said, I was giggle, 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 high pitched giggling, at which point you could see everyone shrinking down in their seat. And then. I kissed him. I, <laughs> my, my, yeah, my, I, on the lips? On the, no, on like, mm, oh, and he okay. might have done like that at the end of the cheek, and I'm so high that be. <laughs> I don't know what I was saying. <laughs> and then the person, the guy who was my co star in the movie, I was like, he, in my head, I'm going, you need to stand up and say something to save me. And my mouth opened to say something else, and my limbic system took over. And my, I clamped down on my tongue, and I bit a hole in my tongue, oh. a bleeding hole in my tongue, a big hole in my tongue. And the co-star says, hello, hello. So now we go out, we're in the parking lot, we're getting ready to shoot. And I have to go up and I have to say, hello, Mr. Eastwood. I just wanted you to know that I was so nervous to meet you that I bit a hole in my tongue. But it's going to be OK. But uh, I'll be OK to shoot the scene. So don't worry. He's like, okay, okay. So we go to shoot the scene. <laughs> Just horrible. We go to shoot the scene, and I use my tongue, and he has a little joke going with the crew. Now, I don't know it, but he's put a piece of tape over the camera, so I don't know that he's shooting. And he's going, okay, let's just do a little rehearsal, but here came a change from... Uh, the script super, apparently the studio needs to hear, instead of we just need to go to Houston, you have to say we need to go to Space Shuttle Mission Control in Houston. There you go. <laughs> okay, so we need to go to Space Shuttle Mission Control in Houston. <laughs> I had to do it, he made me do it like 10 times. Space Shuttle Mission Control, hold on, hold on. Space Shuttle Mission Control. It was like, I was going completely out of my element. And then at some point he said, no, Marsha, just say we need to go to Houston. And I said, thank God. And I realized he'd been shooting and he was just having a big joke with me. <laughs> that was Clint Eastwood. So he's, he's a bit of a, um, he likes to play, he likes to play games. He likes to poke a little fun. And if you like the stories, I'll tell you another one because we did Mystic River later together. Which you were nominated for, right? He was nominated yeah. for Mystic River, right? So. Thank you. By now I know that when you show up for a Clint Eastwood movie, um, you bring what you want to be. You don't, he's not, not going to be big fitting. So I brought long hair pieces, I brought my coats, I brought my outfit so I could show him what I wanted the character to be. And her name was Cecilia. And it, there's one scene with Tim Rob, oh, where she's out in the parking lot and it's raining. And she's just really thinks that her husband murdered this girl. And it's raining and I'm like, and she's supposed to 
cry. I think she was supposed to cry. I think it said cry in the scene. And I thought, I'm going to show Clint that I can do that in one take. So there go the windshield wipers. And he doesn't say action. He says, go ahead, you know, whenever, whenever you're ready. And he never says cut. He says, that's enough of that. So he says, go ahead, whenever you're ready. I said, <laughs> and it's the windshield wipers going on and on. And the rain comes in. <laughs> Crying real tears, real tears, real tears. And then he says, OK, that's enough of that. And he comes over, and I roll down the window, waiting for my praise. Like, that was great. One take. Let's move on. He goes, Marsha. I said, yes. He says, can you bring it way down? I said, yes. Oh my god, of course I can. I'm so sorry. It was raining. So I thought that like Cecilia was the rain, that her emotions were the rain. <laughs> and he says, Marsha, she's not even the mist. I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> and whenever I'm ready, here I go. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> not a chance. <I'm> like, <laughs> you know, that's enough of that and moving on. But he was, he's, he's great. I love him. I love, love, love him. You and Laura, not to stick on Mystic River too long, but I always found that you and Laura Linney were the, the secret weapons of that, of that movie. Like, a lot of praise went to Sean Penn and Tim Robbins, who did wonderful jobs, but the two of you were really the secret weapons in terms of performance in that movie. And, and what, the what final battle playing. is somehow between the two of them. In the, yes. In the end scene, he has that... Um, she's left with him and her glory, and my character's left chasing after her son in the, in the parade, whatever, yelling for her son. You know, my character's lost out, and my character was the morally right one, which is what's the beautiful thing about Mystic River is that when you do the morally right thing, you get punished. So I don't know about you guys, but I was taught when I'm driving, if you hit somebody by accident, or you hit something in the street, you think it's, you pull over. You get out of the car. That's what you do. You make sure the person's OK. Now, today, I don't know if people would do that, because you think it could be a ruse. They could be wanting to get me. But in my day, that's what you did. And that's what uh, the, the girl did who got murdered. And then the other one was um, the boys. If a cop came by and said, get in my car, you got in the car. You didn't say, let me see your line, your badges. You, you got in the car. So there was a different questioning of authority at that time. And that's the time I also grew up in. But those who did not question authority in that film, got hurt. And then those who didn't, who did do the right thing by pulling over got hurt. So it was a really murky world of morality that he was building there. I'll do one more director before I turn it over to the audience for questions. But um, you work with Sean Penn as a director as, as well. And I'm a, I, I love Sean Penn as a director. I think his films are some of the most under Crossing Guard and, and Indian Runner and, and Into the Wild are very are wildly underrated movies. What was it like working with him as a as a director? Just as professional as you could hope for. He knew what he wanted. He was fantastic with the crew. He was excited about being in Alaska. He was excited about telling this big story. He made sure we got to meet with the family. I got to meet Billy the mom. Uh, so he made sure that you got to do your character work because he's an actor. He could pull from you. He, he knew just how to pull from you what he needed to pull, not unlike Ed Harris, another actor, who during Pollock, Ed could pull what he needed to pull respectfully but breaking bounds. I mean, at one point, I think Ed, I needed him to shake me to do something, and he just shook me and shook me and shook me, and I said, okay, great. And the crew was like, whoa, that was weird. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you trust him, it's not weird at all. They can just help you get outside your body. And Sean was the same way. He could help you get outside your expectations of yourself to something you didn't expect. Um, who has some questions in the audience? Right here. Hi. Uh, what interested you to take the role of the movie? In Fifty Shades? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's an event. So it's, it was bigger than anything I'd ever looked at. And second of all, I wanted the mom to be um, sensual and important and a little bit tongue in cheek. I wanted to humanize the character, him. So if I was just sort of that perfect mom, then I didn't think people would relate to it. So the first thing I d she does is tease him a little bit, like, hmm, you know, a little bit roll her eyes at him, because everybody else is so afraid of him. Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray, and all the blonde girls in the office, Mr. Gray. And my, I wanted my character to be like, come on, honey. It's my boy. I changed those diapers. Get in here. And so that's a little bit of what I tried to give the character, along with enormous cleavage in the masquerade scene. <laughs> 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 Uh, next question. Right Hi, here. Marcia. Um, so there's a very interesting theme of motherhood in the books. Uh, we have a triangle, basically, of motherhood. I mean, there's Christian's birth mother, who is right. a, a prostitute whore. 
uh, drug crack dealer or whatever she was. And then there's That's enough. Yeah, no, we got it. She yeah. pretty much <laughs> prostitute not, down, down. Down. You know, it. not good. Um, then, uh, then there's Carla, who's the most egocentric, horrible mother I've seen, um, besides the crack whore. Um, and and then there's Grace, Grace Trevelyan Gray, and. I mean, talk about the ugly cry. Anytime I read about her in the book, I just was sobbing, including having to change mm -hmm. the buses because of that. Um, so what are, are we going to see that um, side of grace yeah. in this? Yeah. yeah, and what I love about her is she's also a mama bear, right? Mama grace bear. So, like, listen, anybody F with my kids, and you're done Right? I mean, that's the thing. That's the boundary. You don't mess with my... If you're right, if my kid was a shit, then you can tell me about it and I'll mess with him. But don't, don't bully. And so um, he, you see that in her. She was betrayed by her best friend. And you see that you know, famous scene with Kim Basinger, the famous slap. Um, and we did it. Um, but Kim, oh, she's an amazing actress. And she does this little thing. And I'm like, how could you have just won the scene when I slapped you? But she does. Because she takes, what she does is I slap her. And I've won. And then she takes this hanky that she has. And she goes, ding. And she drops it on the floor. And I'm like, how? You just won with hanky. You can't win when I just slapped you. That's not fair. But it's, a, it's an interesting little She's, she's the knife twister, right? That's what her character is, and my character is the rise above it all. So you do see that, and it's, it was important to me that you had, because the roles of sex and women and all that, and older women are, are really important to me as an older woman, and what we teach our children is really important to me as an older woman, and that we don't say, that we don't cut off the sexuality at a certain age. Is it anybody who's had kids know that once you've had kids, you're like, don't even think about it, sweetie, because <laughs> got to get up in the morning and make the breakfast. So, so I, what I liked was that this storyline was kind of opening up to saying, come on, girls, don't forget about that side. Don't forget about the playful side of you. Don't forget about that couched in this romance. I thought that was lovely, but I thought that Grace was, um, she was intelligent, she was smart, she was a doctor, and I think it was important to have that represented. I think we have time for one more question, right here. Hi, Marsha. Congratulations on the Fifty Shades movies, but also on um, Code Black, which is one of the best dramas on television. Thank you. I love Code oh. Black. I have two questions, actually, pertaining to the show. First off, um, favorite storyline or character? Mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a problem with that? Um, it's really this one that I was telling you, that, that you, you met the character in the beginning, this little girl, Ariel, who lost her dad and had to make this incredibly difficult moral choice to give the dad's heart away. And, and she's in denial about it. And this, this happens all the time. People are met with sudden tragedy. And they have to make that decision almost immediately. You've just lost your mother, but can we have her liver? Or can we have her heart? And you're not ready to let go. You don't think you really lost your mother. You think God's going to wake up tomorrow and go, just kidding, or it was a, you know, there's a medical miracle and she's back. But more often than not, obviously that doesn't happen. So people have to make these incredibly difficult decisions, and that's what that young child did. And I think it cooked people into the show. And the, the, me, and, me and Louis Guzman, that's definitely my favorite relationship in the show, Mama and Papa, but then the child goes away, and now she's come back. And it's Louis Guzman who's kind of looking at it going, she's here for a reason. And it's me going, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And, but she's, she's back with her own needs, and it brings something out of Leanne that I just love. And then my other question is, how does it feel to be the character on the show referred to as Daddy? Great. <laughs> I make my kids refer to me as Daddy. <laughs> My daddy, mama daddy, my daddy at home. No, it feels great. And she's, uh, you know, I like that gender switch. And in fact, as the show is structured, Louis is the more nurturing one. Louis is the kinder one. Louis is the life lessons one. There's a part of my character that's like, come on, forget it, let's go. You fall in line or you fall out of line. And I like that, except that she's, unlike other people who say you fall in line or you fall out of line, she's not psychologically um, unbalanced. She's balanced if you know what I'm saying. How do you like working with Louis Guzman? I love Louis Guzman. He's, he, Louis, Louis crazy. Yes. Louis, you know, what Louis is. 
Luis is hey, mamacita, come on. Yo, 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 what's up? It's Luis Guzman. I mean, that's what he does all the time, and I love it. He's fantastic. He's the life of the show. Marsha, I have to let you go. Uh, it's been so wonderful talking to you. Thank you for being here. Thank How you. can people see Fifty Shades Darker? Okay. Guys, it's not opening on Valentine's Day because if everybody knows, we need a little form playing, right? So it's opening a, a few days before Valentine's Day on the 10th is Fifty Shades of Grey. And then Wednesdays at 10, you have the last, on CBS, or the last two episodes. Not Fifty Shades, sorry, Fifty Shades Darker on February 10. And then uh, Code Black is Wednesday at 10. And then the final next Wednesday at 10. And they're beautiful episodes, so watch them. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Marsha Gay Harden. Marsha Gay Harden, thank you. Thank you.